In this video, we'll be looking at Tomura questions that have both necessary and sufficient elements to them. So I've made separate videos already on both necessity and sufficiency doing Tomura exam questions. And now we're going to do the questions that have both things in them as well. Now, this sounds much harder than it is. I think if you've got each of these individual ideas down, then you shouldn't have too much of an extra problem with the questions that deal with both of them. Um, but let's get into it and see how it goes. Firstly, I'll just um, remind yourself of how to deal with these two things on their own very quickly. So to decide whether something is necessary, uh, it's counterexamples, right? It's counterexamples of both. You just use the counterexamples slightly differently. To decide whether something is necessary, what you're looking for is you're looking to try and find a time where the result still happens without the thing that's claimed to be necessary. For example, let's look at this statement. It is necessary to be odd to be a prime. Can we find a time where it's possible to be prime without this happening? And yeah, we can find two. Two is prime and it's not odd. So it is not necessary to be odd to be prime, although almost every prime is odd. It's not necessary because of this counterexample. Right. And most of the time, actually, um, when, we, when I did this video, it didn't use the word necessary. It used, it used words like must something be odd or does it have to be? So actually, sometimes you don't see the word necessary, but you're still doing the same thing. And I did that in the previous video. Um, another one then, it is necessary to be Chris Hemsworth to be beautiful. Again, not necessary. Like it's sufficient and we'll get sufficient in a bit, but it's not necessary because, for example, lots of the people who are sitting watching this video are also beautiful but probably aren't Chris Hemsworth, unless you are Chris Hemsworth, um, in which case the, the point is moot. Cool. To decide whether something is sufficient, again, it's counterexamples. Oh, different animation here, excellent. It's counterexamples, but you're using them for a slightly different purpose, right? You're going to say you need to find a time when the result doesn't happen despite the thing being claimed as sufficient happening. So if you take this one here, it's sufficient to have four right angles to be a square. What I need to find is I need to find an example where this thing does happen, where it is four right angles, but it's not square. And of course, our counterexample can be a rectangle. Right? So we're doing the opposite almost. In, we're saying the first bit needs to be true and then showing a case where the second bit isn't. Whereas before, for necessary, we, we, we were requiring the second bit to be true, but finding a time where the first thing wasn't. So it's almost the opposite case. And we just got to really have it in your heads, really nice and clear, no matter how. It doesn't really matter how you do it, but nice and clear in your heads which one is which, right? Otherwise, you'll get yourself all into a twist. Um, you can think to yourself, is there anything else that's needed or required? Does it guarantee the outcome? These are the kind of things you can think in your head every time you see sufficient that some people I know do think about and helps them out. Um, another example, and then we'll, I promise we'll get into some tomorrow questions. It is sufficient to have the same digit twice to be a multiple of 11. Now, clearly that happens a lot of time, 22, 33, and so on. But you can find counterexamples where you have the same digit twice and you're not a multiple of 11. For example, 1.1 1 .1 or 101, because it didn't say you couldn't have any other digits and it didn't say you had to be an integer. So there's some counterexamples there. Um, one thing that you could do, so one thing you could do here is you could hold some of these examples, these basic examples that I just went through, you could hold those in your head as you walk into the exam, just so you can unpick them again. And that way you can remind yourself exactly what the word means. The other thing you could do in the next month is you could just go about your daily life using the language of necessity and sufficiency, practicing it as you go about your daily business. So for example, you could think some of these things around uh, you know, day to day and uh, and maybe you'll get better. Just be careful to use them properly, otherwise you'll be practicing the wrong thing. But you'll find, I think, that you'll generally get better at it if you practice using the words. And you don't have to do that during a Tamua practice session. You can do it about your daily life as well. Okay, so now that's finally getting some exam questions then. I, I did promise that we would do some of these. So here's two statements. f of x equals zero exactly three times. Well, that's just a root, isn't it? So this is saying three roots exactly. Uh, and this is saying uh, two turning points exactly. Which of the following is correct? As now P starts every time and Q finishes. So let's unpick each of these. Let's first deal, when you've got both necessary and sufficient, deal with one of them first, then the other. So let's say, is P necessary for Q? Is three roots necessary for two turning points? Let's assess that first. So in other words, can I find, uh, I, I want to maybe find a counterexample, because again, it's all about counterexamples. I want to find a counterexample where I have two turning points, but not three roots. And that's a very easy cubic to draw. Two turning points, only one root. So having three roots is not necessary for having two turning points because of this picture here. So I can cross out both of the necessary ones. And then we say, is having three roots sufficient for having two turning points? In other words, again, we did this sufficiency video before, 
can you find a time where you have three roots but not two turning points? And again, not too difficult to draw. Three roots here, more than two turning points. So it's not sufficient either. There are my counter examples. I can cross out that one as well and I get not necessary and not sufficient. So we just do what we did in the previous two videos, but we deal with um, one of them first. It doesn't matter which. I always do necessary first and then sufficiency and eventually you'll get down to the answer. So again, as long as you're good at this thing and good at this thing, these questions really shouldn't be that much worse. Let's do another one again from this paper, same paper here, 2021. Um, so this is a statement that uh, we've got a polynomial, which might end up being important. Numbers A and B and A and C is between A and B. So if we get out a graph, notice how I, without even saying anything, I just sketched graphs. I've talked about in so many videos how important sketching graphs is. Um, what this is saying is you've got three numbers, A less than B, C in the middle of them, and you've got a turning point at C. So it's flat through C. Which of the following is true? This condition is necessary. So it's saying the same condition every time. So let's assess first necessary. So is PA equal PB necessary for uh, this thing here? What, is it? Is, is PA equals PB necessary for this picture, which is essentially this statement? I've just written it in picture form. Is this necessary? Well, this is just saying the graph has to be at the same place. Uh, a and B, but if you make that an inflection point, it's very clear that it doesn't have to be the case, right? P of A is up here, uh, like positive something. P of B is down here, like negative something. So clearly this is not necessary. I can find a case in which um, I have this, but I don't require this. That's not necessary. Cross out both necessaries. Then of course say, is P of A equal P of B sufficient for this to happen? So if P of A is equal to P of B, so for example, something like this. So we go the opposite way, right? We start with this statement and then we try and find a case where this doesn't happen. If, if, if the graph goes through this point and this point, is there a point C in the middle somewhere? C doesn't have to be right in the middle. It could be anywhere between the two. Is there a point somewhere between the two that is flat? And, and it kind of, you, you very quickly realize if it's a polynomial, then yes, right? If it's a polynomial, it's a continuous function. So it has to turn somewhere to get back to this point, regardless of which way around it's going through, it has to turn somewhere to get back to it, right? Um, I thought for a moment, could I, could I just draw a straight line? But of course, a straight line like this means that it's, it's flat everywhere. Um, so, so this is not a counter example. And so, and so it is sufficient. It is sufficient, right? It must turn somewhere between the two. Um, in order to get back to, to, the, to the same vertical height, I guess you could you could think of it as. Okay, um, let's do some more then. So this one has uh, one sufficient check and one necessary check, not both at the same time. So there's a lot going on here. Um, you just have to read it very carefully, um, and, uh, and 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 uh, and so on. But okay, so we've got an arithmetic sequence um, with, with 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 a first time and a difference call, um, non-zero integers. Yeah, sure. Um, Property P says, for some positive integer m, the sum of the first m terms is equal to the sum of the first 2m. So looking at this sequence here, or the one that starts at 11 has a difference of minus 2, the sum of the first four terms is, of course, equal to the sum of the first eight, because look at those second four terms. They all cancel each other out, which is very convenient. And so the sum of the first four terms is equal to the sum of the first eight. Now, it's saying, which of these is true? For something, for a sequence to have this property, it's sufficient that a, d less than zero. So what we have to do is we need to find a case where this is true and this thing doesn't happen. And, and, and I thought, well, okay, all I need to do here is I need to find two numbers that multiply to make less than zero. Let's just choose 10 and minus two, because I notice if I just change this one slightly, it's probably not gonna work and it doesn't, right? It doesn't work anymore. The first four terms don't add up to make the next four because we don't have this really nice cancelling action going on anymore. And it doesn't work anywhere else in the sequence either. So this is very quickly, we, we can check this isn't sufficient. It's not enough just to make these two things multiply to make less than zero because we've got a case where it didn't work. Um, so it's not sufficient just to have that. Is it necessary that the difference is even? So you can see here the difference is even. Is it necessary that the difference is even to make this work? And I thought, well, okay, well, the key thing here was the cancelling action that was going on here. Surely I can make that with just a difference of one, which of course isn't even. And this doesn't quite work because, well, I don't have an even, uh, like the first time is here, the second term, uh, I mean, this does actually work, right? It took me a little while to work out that this does work. If you ignore the minus one, it works. Here's the first term that just adds up to one. So if M, if the first M terms are just one, um, 
it, it, the, the, the first m terms where m is 1 just add up to 1. The first two terms add up to 1. So this actually works if you just if you just take these two bits here. Um, the minus 1 is irrelevant. But of course this one also works and that's the one that I actually found. Um, the first uh, three terms add up to the first six terms because these three terms cancel each other out which is nice. Um, so neither of them uh, work. We found a case where this wasn't sufficient and, and, and d even wasn't necessary because I found a case where d is odd. Um, so neither of them. Good, I think this is um, probably the last one I'll do, I'm not sure though. Um, consider the positive same number a, b, and then a, b is divisible by m. Condition either a or b is necessary, okay, so again, let's do necessary first. Let's say a or b divisible by n is necessary for a, b to be divisible by n. Now, the way that I found a counterexample for this so quickly is because, and again, this is why practice is so useful, there was exactly the same question like this asked in another paper, just asked in a different way. And it pointed out the example, because it was doing the question backwards, it pointed out the example a equals 4, b equals 4, n equals 16. I can't remember exactly what paper it was because I couldn't be able to look it up. Um, but a, b, which is 16, is divisible by 16, of course. But a isn't divisible by 16, and nor is b, because, of course, they're smaller than it. So it's not necessary for a or b to be divisible by n. Right, so it's not necessary. So we'll get out the, rid of the necessary ones. Is it sufficient? Right? Is uh, is either of these things being divisible by n sufficient to conclude this is? Well, okay. If a and or b are divisible by n, that means that a divided by b or b divided by n, sorry, a divided by n or b divided by n is an integer. Right? Like ten is divisible by two because ten divided by two is an integer five. But of course, then we consider a b over n which we can just write as a over n times b. Now, b is an integer, and so is a over n because of this first bit, or, of course, the other way around, b over n and a. But in either case, you see that it is sufficient, right? This is always going to be an integer if one of these things is. So it is sufficient, but it's not necessary. Um, I have got one more example because I could not resist putting in some trig and exact values into this video, apparently. So this one's a little bit more tricky. We've got to do some work first. Um, Let's first assess what this is talking about. When we put in k as 1, we just get sine of pi over 3. And when we put in k as 2, we get sine of 2 pi over 3. When we put in k as 3, we get sine of pi. And so on. Now, your exact value should tell you what each of these are. Sine of pi over 3 is root 3 over 2, which is very convenient because of this. And then you draw the graph and you work out, okay, well, pi over 3 is this way. It's symmetrical with pi over 2. So 2 pi over 3, which is another pi over 3 along, must also be root 3 over 2. Sine of pi is clearly 0. Um, this is going to be negative root 3 over 2, that's going to be negative root 3 over 2 for the same reasons, and that's going to be 0. And how many, what values of n can I choose to make this sum equal that? Well, if I choose n is 1, clearly, right, n equals 1 works, because I just have this term, which is this, which is this. But also, if you take the first four terms, this one cancels with this one, and you just get left with that, because that doesn't matter, obviously. So n equals 4 works. And then we look down there here and we say, okay, which of these conditions is therefore necessary? n is 1 is not necessary because n equals 4 works. It's not necessary for n to be 1 because it could be 4 instead. Clearly it's not necessary for n to be a multiple of 3 because each because either of these work, but 4 does and it's not a multiple of 3. It's not necessary for n to be a multiple of 6 because 4 works. It's not necessary for n to be 1 more than a multiple of 6 because 4 works. It's not necessary for n to be 1 more than a multiple of 6 or 2 more than a multiple of 6 because 4 works. And that's neither of those things. And we're just left with this one, which you can then show is sufficient if you want to, because what you can argue is, well, every time you get 3 of these, the next one will cancel with, so so look at the first three, um, the next one will cancel with one of these ones and you'll just be left with this one left over. When you look at the next multiple of three, it will all cancel out and the next one, one more than the, because when you take the first six, they all cancel and then the seventh one will just provide the root three over two necessary and then the logic repeats itself over and over again. So one more than multiple of three is definitely always going to make this work, but it doesn't really matter because I've eliminated every other one anyway. Um, so the answer is going to be D. Um, thank you so much for watching. I hope that wasn't too much of a, a horrific nightmare to get through. I know lots of people find these questions very difficult. Um, so I just wanted to see if I could help out a little bit there. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next time.